Hello, and welcome back to the Movie Mouth Film and TV Podcast. This week, we'll be discussing the latest movie news, film trailers, new release reviews, including Wonder Woman 84, Sputnik, WandaVision, Cobra Kai Season 3, and Chadwick Boseman's final film performance in Netflix's Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. On top of it all, every week we discuss a classic film in our video store corner section. And this week, we'll be rocking our Stonewash Levi's and nothing else, as we rip the throat out of Patrick Swayze's Roadhouse. More of that later in the show. This is Miles, and as ever, I'm joined by a man who once told me, get busy living or get busy dying. That's goddamn right. For the second time in my life, I'm guilty of committing a crime. Parole violation. Of course, I doubt they're going to throw up any roadblocks for that. Not for an old crook like him. I find I'm so excited I can barely sit still or hold a thought in his head. I think it's the excitement only a free man can feel. A free man at the start of a long journey whose conclusion is uncertain. I hope I can make it across the border. I hope to see my friend and shake his hand. I hope the Pacific is as blue as it's been in my dreams. I hope. It's Phil. Hi, Phil. (laughs) Hi, hello. <laughs> hello. How's it, going? How's it going? Really good. Really good. Would you like to explain to our listeners the reasons you caused such a large gap in between episodes? Me? Yes. Well, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I beg to uh, to differ. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, you were off in, you know, we managed to to get a Mexican episode done while you're off there, haven't you? And, we did. Uh, uh, and then, you know, you've just been a busy boy, haven't you? I've been a busy bunny. I have yeah. been a busy bunny. You've been a busy boy. And it's been Christmas and New Year. And we had a we had a great old uh, Zoom New Year, didn't we? We really did. Not <laughs> one for the listeners, I think. I don't think we could possibly talk about what we did on that no. Zoom at New Year's. <laughs> Maybe not. Probably, but you did something really cool. Been. I celebrated the UK New, New Year with you. I'm here in New York again. I'm back. Um, I love this town. <laughs> and uh, you did something really cool. I, I was there for the UK New Year, and then you stayed up with me for the New York New Year, which was awesome. And we got to celebrate. And it was uh, a, it was a long but brilliant night. It was a long but brilliant Definitely, night. Definitely, uh, Danny Glovered it the next day. Woke up. <laughs> well, woke up, woke up after my few hours of sleep, and uh, definitely muttered to myself, "I'm too old for this shit." That's funny because I woke up and did a full-on Mel Gibson and put a gun in my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's all laugh at that. Um, so, what have you been doing during your hiatus? Did you watch many TV shows, movies? Uh, yeah, I've actually watched loads. Mm-hmm. Of um, well, Christmas is the kind of time where you just want to watch a load of films anyway. Mm-hmm. So Christmas was great watch the old christmas standards you know die hard um home alone one and two jingle all the way ho ho malone <laughs> uh actually watched die hard what did i say die hard i watched die hard two this time instead oh, because die carly my wife had not seen it which what? i was immensely shocked to find out so we remedied it quite quickly so instead of die hard one which is normally done every year but i had already watched it last year uh Die Hard 2 got watched instead. How can the same shit happen to the same guy twice? <laughs> I mean, it's still set at Christmas. so Brilliant. I love it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, a lot of Christmas films and a few other bits and pieces. Um, too many to mention, really. It's ridiculous, isn't it? Yeah. I have a tradition of watching The Lion King on Christmas Day, which is what I did this year. Right. Um, the original, the OG, not the John Favreau the remake. The one I haven't seen. <laughs> We we gotta cut that out because no one's gonna to want to listen to your opinion on movies if you haven't seen the best animated movie of all time. Fuck them. Um, <laughs> but I uh, watched that, and then I remembered that last year I was actually in the Serengeti in the middle of like Lion King land, and I remember waking up and it being like. Um, so that was cool. Um, I also watched a couple things on HBO Max. I've got an HBO Max subscription now here in the States. Um, there's this new movie called Locked Down. Locked Down. Um, mm. Starring Chiwetel Ejiofa and Anne Hathaway about a couple that are kind of drifting apart while in lockdown during yeah, COVID-19. I saw the for this. Yeah, and um, so it's written by Stephen Knight, who wrote uh, Peaky Blinders, among many other things, directed Locke uh, with Tom Hardy. 
Um, and directed by Doug Lyman of Go and Edge of Tomorrow or Live, Die, Repeat, whatever the hell you want to call it. Right. Um, amazing. Like, it's crazy how quickly they've thrown this thing together. Really well written, two really great central performances, and I really enjoyed that. Um, and also a film that I, I actually had tickets to see just before the lockdown in New York. It's a film called The Road's Not Taken, which is a, a film directed by Sally Potter and uh starring javier bardem and l fanning which is about a a man uh javier bardem and his daughter and he's going through an unspecified illness he's kind of forgetting who he is and unable to communicate and that kind of thing um but he starts to visualize where his life could have gone if he'd taken certain decisions earlier right. and so it's about here the interplay between those kind of three lives that you see and really good really emotional film but really touching film um split a lot of people down the middle but it's a classic miles movie and uh i really i did really like it i have to say um that so i'm really good. glad i got to, yeah i'm glad i got Bardem's to see that. always good in whatever he does though really and he's bloody brilliant in this really yeah. really good really affecting like you know you can you can you know i don't want to quote tropic thunder but you can watch certain movies <laughs> with actors in certain roles and you you're watching an actor you know play a certain type of affliction and in this is just he, you know he inhabits the, the the role and the illness so really touching mm. so the road's not taken um if you like your movies deep and depressing definitely check that one out okay so this week we're going to skip over the listener question um we're going to focus more on last year and obviously for a lot of people it was a really really tough year um not only that but it was also a year of watching a lot of tv and a lot of movies at home hence everybody being stuck indoors so what we wanted to do is put together a top 10 list of the movie mouth podcast favorite films and tv of the last 12 months and we put this together alongside not only phil myself but also some of our favorite contributors to the movie mouth podcast and also some of our listeners um so thank you very much for those of you that did uh, contribute here um and uh, phil you want to get us started off so, start with movies. Number 10 was a potentially very unexpected entry. <laughs> and that was Gerard Butler in End of the World Scenario Greenland. Let's play a game of fuck off. You go first. <laughs> uh, yeah, so this was, uh, this was one of my choices. And it, it's just, it, I, I didn't expect... I think it's fair to say that Gerard Butler's output in recent years has been a bit uh, straight to DVD <laughs> in the fact that, you know, the, the fallen films and things just f have that feel about them. They're not nothing, you know, groundbreaking. And I, I suppose no. neither is this, but for uh, to sit down <laughs> and watch a disaster film <laughs> in what was a disastrous year for everyone, uh, wasn't particularly a good prospect, but I, <laughs> I really enjoyed it. I thought it was really well done, and it kept me, it kept me gripped. And yeah, it was one, it was definitely one of the the better, like one of the films I enjoyed more last year. Couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. So strange having a Gerard Butler film in our top ten, but I know. <laughs> keep it going, Jerry. We loved it. Uh, so at number nine was Queen and Slim. This was the Daniel Kaluuya and Jodie Turner-Smith starring movie about two people of color in America whose first date takes an unexpected turn when a police officer pulls them over. So very current movie, um, very in tone with obviously a lot of the civil rights uh, conversations that were happening last year. Um, and protests and so on around the the George Floyd uh, murder. Um, this was directed by Melina Matsukas. Um, great, really great film, um, and uh, definitely worth checking out. Um, so number nine, Queen and Slim. Number eight would be The Vast of Night. So this was, I'll talk particularly about this one, as, as I know this was very high on my list. Uh, it was a, basically a, a newcomer movie um starring pretty much no one you've ever seen before in anything directed by a gentleman called andrew patterson and also written by andrew patterson no relation um it's it, it it centers around one night in new mexico in the late 1950s where a switchboard operator and a radio dj discover a strange audio frequency which could change the future or their futures forever mm -hmm. um extraterrestrial in nature won't spoil it 
starts off with a really great tracking shot through a basketball game in the 50s. There's some other really great tracking shots that they put in there. Um, it's, it's done on a shoestring budget, but it's a really good film. And very rarely do these kind of independent or first-time directors, you know, kind of come up with something that's so well stylized uh, visual, visually and also also very deep. So really like that movie, The Vast of Night. If you have Amazon Prime, check it out. Um, I highly, highly recommend that. Um, so number seven in the list, and this was a real surprise, uh, was the Bloomhouse horror, The Invisible Man, directed by Lee Wan L uh, and starring Elizabeth Moss uh, and Oliver, Oliver Jackson Cohen. Um, this was a real surprise, as I said. Uh, it's a very, very well stylized, very well put together movie, again, on a low budget, um, mm -hmm. about a um, an abusive ex relationship um, when uh, Elizabeth Moss's ex takes his own life um ends up leaving her his fortune and she then suspects that his death was a was a hoax and then a series of kind of weird coincidences start kind of happening to her and she starts to suspect that he might not actually be dead right um and this was a real like i said a real surprise um it had a really good cast there's a, a great scene in there again i won't spoil it but the restaurant scene in particular uh was a, <laughs> was a real shock um, and again, one of the one of those movies, a horror movie, where they actually can pick out a centralized performance from someone. Elizabeth Moss, in particular, here, she, she's, a, I would say, an Oscar worthy performance. Um, it's not going to get any recognition from the Academy because they never recognize, sadly, horror horror movies. Mm. If it does, you know, she she would definitely get my vote. But the the Invisible Man was really good and uh, and really worth uh, checking out. Um, number six on the list. Uh, now, this is another one that that kind of came out of left field, and I think it shows the depth of movies that uh, that kind of came out over 2020 and the exposure to those movies that we had um, is the the man standing next, which is a Korean movie um, starring quite quite a few very well known uh, like uh, Lee Byung Hun, um, who in in this case in in the 1970s Korea. Um, it's under absolute control of, of President Park, who controls the KCIA, basically an, org an organization that has uh, over the edge of any branch of government. Um, and this was a real, really interesting thriller, historical, of course, as well. Um, and obviously off the back of the likes of Parasite, you know, another great step in the direction of, of Korean movies. Um, and certainly, you know, if, you, if, you're, if you're starting to, to look into more of the world cinema aspect, then this is highly, highly recommended. So The Man Standing Next uh was was there at uh, number six number five uh now this is a movie that came out towards the end of the year and it is in fact our only animated movie in the list and that mm -hmm. is disney pixar's soul starring jamie fox and tina fey um so this was released at christmas day on disney plus so if you have a disney plus account you can watch this right now um again pixar movie uh it was from the same director as uh inside out um and monsters inc uh it was also um you know another kind of internal let's say more of a an adult um uh, pixar movie than a, a kids movie but still yeah. caters to both audiences um and a really really great central performance from jamie fox a movie that i had actually had to watch twice um after the first time i watched it i watched it twice <laughs> in a row um really really good really affecting very emotional uh, and an amazing score as well by trent Reznor and atticus ross Wow. who did you know a lot of the david finch stuff so um, i need to watch this up yeah yeah I've not, I've not caught it yet but yeah i will be highly highly recommended and especially if you're like yourself you know you're a musician um but you have passions in life and that kind of thing um this kind of plays more to that that audience and uh yeah i mean it's it's not without its its issues it was great to see a pixar movie have its first ever central lead character as a person of color they did make a few missteps with it um, you know, namely without, again, giving any spoilers away, um, but that that uh, character being turned into something else um, was fairly disappointing. Um, but, right. you know, it dep depends which way you look at it. I really liked the film, thought it was great. And again, very, very uh, affecting. Next one on the list, Phil, you can talk about this one. Uh, this is number four, Joseph Gordon-Levitt in 7,500 or 7,500. Yeah. It's again, 7500. <laughs> however you want to put it, <laughs> 7500. Um, I love this. This was one of the best for me in, during the year. Um, 
so this is the uh plane hijacking psychological thriller that's set entirely within uh the cockpit of the plane pretty much apart from like one scene <laughs> uh and it was i said it at the time when we reviewed it but it was one of the most tense films i've seen in years it really did keep me on the edge of my seat uh watching the whole thing it was it was great it was brilliantly acted i said it was only what f- four people in it pretty much um but brilliant a uh, really really different as well love the way it was shot you know sort of really effective use of um the, the you know the only sort of view of the outside world you get is through the cctv camera which overlooks mm-hmm. the pilot like the cockpit door um other than that it's just within that confined cockpit space with him freaking out while his plane's being hijacked it's just <laughs> fantastic it's such a good film I, I loved it really good and a good return from gordon gordon levitt as well it's funny a, a family member of mine actually watched this after listening to your review and he texts me straight away saying great movie do not watch it if you're hungover <laughs> <laughs> no totally not yeah i think it was a bit stressful yeah i think you'd, yeah not a good idea Number three was a movie that, for me, at the start of the year, probably was my favorite movie so far. Um, still high up in the list, and that is Spike Lee's The Five Bloods, which is about four African-American Vietnam vets who battle the forces of man and nature when they return to Vietnam, seeking the remains of their fallen squad leader, played by the late, great Chadwick Boseman, and the gold fortune that he helped them hide. Um, now this was a for me a really affecting movie it was i think it came out the week after george floyd was was murdered yeah it was um, it was very close to the time yeah crazy so how quick it came really, out uh, and yeah. how relevant um but you know this starred delroy lindo um jonathan majors clark peters norm lewis ishaya whitlock um and they you know obviously all playing the older vets um, something they did really nice that I really liked about this is how they played not only the older vets going to Vietnam, but also the younger vets in Vietnam at the time of the battles that the, when they lost um, the, the character played by Chadwick Boseman. Central yeah. performance, Delroy Lindo. For me, he's nailed on for the Oscar this year as the, the leading man, even <sighs> yeah, though... he was amazing. Yeah, and it was, even though it was an unsympathetic performance, he's wearing a Make America Great Again cap throughout the movie. and mm. But the central performance was absolutely incredible from him um and uh you know we we hope that he he gets that uh that recognition um so number two and this might give away what number one is is christopher nolan's tenet Mm. phil tell us about it tenet the only film i managed to watch actually in a cinema in the entirety of last year (laughs) is that why it was high up on your list no uh now if i'm brutally honest i still don't quite understand it (laughs) (laughs) but i think the main thing about tenet is that it was so interesting to Mm -hmm. watch and just the way that it did something which has just never been done before in what i know of yep uh you know the whole reverse thing and knowing after you know after having seen it knowing that some of the fight scenes and that were acted as if they were in reverse is just insane to me but you know we all know that chris nolan makes some amazing films i love the way he shoots stuff his use of practical effects and you know grand scale like set pieces had all of it Mm -hmm. it was slightly confusing a lot of people were complaining about the sound design in it, which I I don't really agree with, but mm-hmm. it was good. It was really good. Yeah. I I mean, it's weird. It was still kind of a disappointment, but it was also my number one movie of the year. Right. Um, so I, I don't know, again, if it was because of just going to the BFI IMAX with you and other friends and, you know, having a absolutely amazing time you know watching it and being together in a in a cinema after all the shit that happened this year and is still happening right now Mm -hmm. um i think the scale of it as well seeing it on an imax screen and yeah i don't think i don't think a lot of the performances in it were particularly great um i think that the the movie was fairly emotion free um 
but I still did really very much enjoy the spectacle of it. And, um, and like you said, you know, things that we've never seen on, on screen happening and things that kind of still trying to get our heads around cerebrally. Yeah. Um, you know, so, and it's also, I think the only movie this year that I bought on Blu-ray to watch again. Right. You know, having having already seen it, so I think that yeah. that says a lot for me if I'm if I'm invested in it in in that kind of way. Um, but maybe I should watch it again. <laughs> maybe I'll I definitely need it. to watch it again at some point. And try and yeah. understand it again. Yeah, Tom Hardy was good in it, though, wasn't he? <laughs> to quote a friend of ours. Oh my god! Yeah. <laughs> Do you want to tell that story? Uh, yeah. So, so one of the guys that we went to the cinema with was a friend of ours. And he, um, if he wasn't a friend of ours, he probably would have been physically harmed by myself <laughs> during the watching of it, just because he, uh, he's the kind of guy, he didn't give it a chance. He, he was asleep for most of the film. Um, he woke up, I think, halfway through, uh, tapped me on the shoulder and whispered in my ear, yeah, Phil. It's really dry, this, isn't it? It's really dry. <laughs> and then he went back to sleep. And then I think he woke up for a bit at the end. Um, and what's the actor's name that looks partly... Aaron Taylor remember. Johnson. Right, yeah. yeah. Uh, and he thought he was... Um, <laughs> he thought Tom he was Hardy. Tom Hardy. And we left the cinema and he was, you know, as you sort of talk about a film as you leave it sort of thing. I was like, well... Did you like what you saw from when you were awake? And he was like, "Well, Tom Hardy was good in it, wasn't he?" I was like, um, "Yeah, that wasn't Tom Hardy, mate." <laughs> he was also calling it Tenant afterwards. Tenant, yeah, Tenant Super. Yeah, I enjoyed Tenant. <laughs> we really like Tenant, but Tom Hardy was good in it. Bless him. Bless, Bless him. him. Bless his little cotton socks. Um, so that means number one this year, the number one movie of the Movie Mouth podcast this year, as voted for by. Us, the co-hosts, and you, the listeners, and our contributors, is Aaron Sorkin's The Trial of the Chicago 7. Phil, this was your number one movie of the year. It was. You want to easily. tell us why? It it was just brilliant. It's the, it was just, again, unexpected. I saw the, you know, because it was a Netflix release, wasn't it? So I saw the trailer for it. I thought that looks, that looks pretty good. It's got a lot of big names in it. Um but the performances on it were just phenomenal. Like just again, just gripping. Uh, and again, I think I said at the time when we reviewed it, I, I don't think I've watched a film in years that's made me so angry watching it just mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For, for the way it was portrayed. And, you know, it, based on true events as we know, but it was just, um, it was a, a, just a great film. Just really, yeah. really good, really well shot. Uh, and I definitely think there should be some Oscars coming out of this one. Who would you say was the standout performance in the movie? <sighs> I, I mean, mean, you've got so many to choose from. Eddie Redmayne, Sasha Baron Cohen, Jeremy Strong, John Carroll Lynch, yeah, uh, uh, Yahya Abdul-Mateen II, Mark Rylance. <laughs> I can't, I, to be honest with you, I really, I really can't, I can't, I can't single anyone out because I think they were just all really, really good. Yeah, yeah. Um, apart from... No, his performance was amazing, but the only thing that grated on me was a little bit was uh, Sasha Baron Cohen's um, accent, American accent. Yeah, yeah, because it was quite. It was a uh, Boston. We want to avoid a war or something yeah. like that. Was like, so yeah, it was. Yeah. But you know, it didn't take anything away from it. It was still like That'd an amazing awesome. performance. So yeah, great. Yeah, yeah, I, I think so too. Really, as always with Sorkin, really well written, um, and again poignant for for this time, and you know. I think that this year has done so many things in terms of content on TV and in movies, you know, whether it's The Five Bloods, you know, whether it's The, the Trial of Chicago 7, whether it's, you know, uh, David Attenborough documentaries on, on Netflix about the, the planet. I think it's made us all a little bit more impassioned about people and getting things right and the things that we've all been kind of glossing over for the last however many decades while we just get on with our lives selfishly and you know being able to refocus a little bit on these kind of issues that have affected humanity or affected the planet or whatever i think is a is a good thing and hopefully we've all become in our quarantine you know no doubt more overweight like me 
but hopefully more conscientious as well about a lot of the, the causes and issues that have been the, the, and continue to affect us all. So, number one. Trial of Chicago Seven, number one movie. Um, we're going to fly through, I think, the TV list, uh, but we'll, I'll, I'll get us, I'll get us started off. Um, so, at number ten, uh, this was an, an interesting one, and it really uh, had so much um, attention this year. Was Michael Jordan's The Last Dance, um, which was a more of a, a docu series, but it, it followed the Chicago Bulls throughout their 1990s uh, kind of victory lap seasons of winning back to back um, NBA titles. Uh, and obviously, you know Michael Jordan himself, uh, Scottie Pippen, and all of the all of the, the really well known players and coaches around that time, and and followed you know his kind of rise through his ascendancy through through the game, um, even you know at times moving out from NBA and going to play baseball stuff like that it was a really interesting, um, I would say, a really interesting uh, show to watch. I think it made a lot of people kind of reminisce for actually seeing live sport again <laughs> considering again that we were we were all kind of held you know indoors which was always an unfortunate position to mm. be in um but again you know really really exciting um number number nine was uh dna um which was uh the tv series um which is about uh, basically five years after his daughter disappears a danish police officer discovers a fatal flaw in the dna database and uh, he might finally be able to to find her um, so that was a really really uh, highly praised international show um number where are we number eight was the boys season two this was a personal pick of mine um, it followed on from the first series of the boys which for me the jury was kind of out on um, this was really good. It expanded the characters really, really well. Um, you know, Carl Urban in the, in the central role, uh, saying the C word, you know, pretty much for the whole thing. Really good show. Um, really looking forward to to season three. And you can see that on Amazon Prime. Uh, next was the Umbrella Academy season two, Phil. Yeah, so I hadn't seen Umbrella Academy season one. Uh it's sort of just been off my radar and then you reviewed season two and i thought i like the sound of this so went back and watched season one uh and then straight into season two uh loved it all thought it was brilliant really good really different uh good fun good fun well-made series yeah definitely yeah, and really enjoyed it they they've also just cast uh season three which is quite exciting because of okay. course we won't say too much but there is a rival academy who are all being currently cast for season three. So we're looking forward to reviewing that one, hopefully this year. Um, okay. So number, uh, that was number seven. Yep. Uh, moving on to number six is dark season three. Phil, another favorite of yours this year. Yeah. So this is the German um, time traveling sci-fi alternate future and past series um was really looking forward to season three one and two were amazing um really worth watching just really well cast really well acted again just does something a bit different uh and very very gripping and it was a really good uh it was a really good third season i think I think that's going to be the final season. I'm not sure. I'm trying to remember how it ended now. But yeah, really, really good. It carried on, you know, where it left off and just did a really good job. Really, really enjoyed it. Great stuff. So we're moving into the serious territory here. Mm -hmm. So at number five, we have the only Apple Plus or Apple TV Plus show on the list. And that is the comedy starring Jason Sudeikis, Ted Lasso which follows a US American football coach who heads to the UK to manage a struggling London football team in the top flight of English football. This I absolutely loved. Unexpectedly, I have to say, um, I do love football. I do love Jason Sudeikis. I don't didn't really want to watch this initially. Um, 12 episodes of, you know, really nice, um, really just heartwarming comedy. Um, also, the fact that you know I'm from the UK originally, so seeing some English-based comedy was also a good thing. Um, but I really liked it. I, th I thought it was just it wears its heart on its sleeve. Really genuine. Um, not just you know ripping you know UK or US culture. It has a lot more depth mm. to it than that. Reminded me of um, you know kind of maybe, maybe kind of like The Office 
uh the uk original kind of series in that yeah. you know it's the, the way that there's a depth to the comedy there's not just it's not just you know a bunch of idiots that you despise and yeah. somehow a central character who is a bit of an idiot who's also someone that's relatable and you know actually you know you actually like has a heart to him so really good and they've, they've obviously you know actioned uh another another season of that which is which is coming soon so really like ted lasso at number five number four uh and suitably at four was season four of netflix's the crown um we reviewed that in the last movie mouth podcast so we won't go into too much detail on it but needless to say bringing it a little bit more up to date um focusing more on uh charles and diana and obviously there's been a lot of you know uh backlash around that and around you know what happened behind closed doors but again it's a you know really really um critical drama to watch and i think if you've got a netflix account and you haven't seen it then uh, you're missing out because you're paying for it and it's absolutely incredible number three is something i still haven't seen and i'm sorry to say it but you loved it better call saul season five yeah i think this was out in early last year i absolutely love this series so this is the follow-on from um um Breaking Bad, <laughs> trying to remember what it was from, uh, and this follows uh, Saul, the Saul Goodman, the uh, lawyer, and his sort of backstory and his uh, origins. And I've just loved every single season of this. Uh, Bob Odenkirk um, just is amazing in these, and yeah, I just can't wait for more. To be honest, I I I, I would go out there and say I've preferred better call Saul to breaking bad easily just because he's so good in it and it, I, i'm really glad they they did a spin-off and it's it's good because it, it just links not if you haven't seen it it just it has really great links back to the uh, back to breaking bad as well but um yeah love it really good well high praise indeed love it and prefer it to breaking bad well that's mm. high praise indeed i think it's controversial I, I, a billion people just screamed out, yes. what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> um, but I, you know, you're not the only one that voted for it, and you're not the only one that had it very, very high up in the list as well. So there obviously, we it's something that I need to get into. You do. Number two? Mm. The Queen's Gambit on Netflix. And this is, of course, the Anya Taylor-Joy starring uh, show which was a mini series directed and written by Scott Frank, who had previously written uh, Godless on Netflix, the the Western. It's about the orf- a girl that's orphaned at the tender age of nine, um, who becomes a, uh, a, a basically a, a chess prodigy. <laughs> um, stick with us. Um, <laughs> it's actually one of the best things on TV. And if it wasn't for whoever is at number one, this would have been number one for sure. It was in everybody's top five list that I requested um it was brilliant i watched all seven episodes in i think a weekend or maybe even a day i don't know (laughs) anymore um but just central performance from anya taylor joy was incredible incredible um script really well written looked amazing yeah had suspense um and told a great a great story i think and you know we're really looking forward to seeing more from scott frank and certainly more from uh, from anya taylor joy yeah definitely so number one, you haven't seen this list, Phil, but you got to know what's at number one, haven't you? I know what's at number one. Go on then. <laughs> it's got to be. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good impression. It's the Mandalorian, isn't it? Season two, baby. Season two. It was special, wasn't it? <laughs> I loved it. Um, And, I, I, well, I I have heard a lot of mixed feelings about and again we're not going to go into it or spoil it at all yeah. but i've had a lot of mixed feelings about the final episode <laughs> the final 10 minutes of the final episode yeah basically um and i agree with some of the criticism it's got but overall what what a great star wars series for fans of star wars like we are it's just it's up there and it? it's just it's perfect yeah i agree every every episode knocked my socks off um waiting to get to the end of the episode to find out who directed it because they didn't release that on IMDb or anywhere on the internet Yeah, to tell you actually who directed. You know, so seeing the likes of, you know, Robert Rodriguez in there, for example, mm. was wild. 
Yeah. John Favreau obviously directed the the first episode, which was awesome. You had Dave Filoni coming back, Bryce Dallas Howard, Deborah Chow, Peyton Reed directed the finale. Um, Carl Weathers even directed one of them. <laughs> I know. Um, and my my personal favorite, uh, Rick uh, Famuyiwa, excuse me, yeah. um, who for me directed some of the well, one of the best episodes in the in in the show. But again, I'll leave it up to you people at home to to define who, which one that was. Um, but yeah, I mean the revelations, the the emotions. I mean, I'm not afraid to admit, as usual, I cried my fucking eyes out in the, at the end of the the last episode. <laughs> I don't even know why. Why did I cry? Why? Um, <laughs> but I just did. It was oh, it's so touching. Um, and uh, you know, on a personal note, I watched this all over the world. Like I, I watched this in Paris. I watched this in Mexico, and and caught up with it, and watched you know some of it. Also, again, when I got back, I watched the last episode again after it finished. Um, and I mean, this is Star Wars now, isn't it? It's, Star Wars is at home on TV and not so much on the big screen, perhaps. But Yeah, potentially. Yeah. And then we have so many uh, more series to come. Yeah, so, the announcement uh, of all the other ones is just yes, indeed. very exciting as well. I wish we could talk more about it, but obviously people may not have seen all of this, but... No, the right. Mandalorian season two is without a doubt our number one was on the list was on everybody's list um, of all of our contributors. In fact, bar one, Jason, this one's for you. Not sure what your problem was, but we disagree. <laughs> um, but thank you everybody for contributing, and uh, we'll be publishing this list on our Instagram account so you can see uh, exactly what that list was. And if you've missed any of these movies or or shows then uh, of course you can you can catch up with them so phil we better get a move on let's uh jump blimey. into blimey sir let's jump into some uh, some quick fire movie news so what have you picked up on this week uh, a couple of uh small announcements well one's not very small the first one is going is that there's going to be a uh deadpool 3 confirmed done it's in the book uh, and it's going to be part of the uh, Marvel Cinematic Universe. Ooh. Um, and also, it's it's the the third sequel to Weekend at Bernie's called Weekend at Bernie's Three Colon Deadpool Three. <laughs> I really hope so. What a crossover that'd be! I'd watch the <laughs> hell out of that. Um, so yeah, this is just saying that it. Um, I think it was an interview with Collider. Um, mm-hmm. Marvel Studios president Kevin Feige. 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 However you want to pronounce his name. <laughs> Feige. 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 Uh, he revealed that Ryan Reynolds is will be starring uh, and is working on the script at the moment. So that's very exciting. Well, Ryan Reynolds, Reynolds is working on the script. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Which is interesting. Um, it's going to be... Rated R, of course, as they have been yes. before, um, which is the best thing about it. Uh, but it will not be filming this year. Oh. So it's going to take a little while yet, but I'm a massive fan of the Deadpool films. Love them. So glad there's going to be a number three. I mean, he could, he could in theory, keep doing these forever, couldn't he? Because he's got some serious prosthesis on his face <laughs> when he's not <laughs> he wearing be. a mask. So... Yeah. And even then, if he gets too old, like he could just have a stuntman running around and just provide the voice. It's endless. <laughs> we'll have it. Deadpool 56, won't we? That's pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that's that. And then the other uh, little bit of news I picked up on, and this is, I suppose, more for um, gaming fans, but especially uh, fans of games based on movies. So this was the uh, announcement that Bethesda, the gaming studio, mm-hmm. uh, famous for Fallout and Skyrim uh, and many others, and another company called Machine Gun Games, uh, Machine Games, sorry, not Machine Gun, Machine Games, uh, working alongside Lucasfilm Games on a new Indiana Jones title with an, with an original story. Oh, so right. that's going to be very exciting. And then also with... Along with that, I think announced the day after was that Ubisoft, another giant of gaming, yes. um, are teaming up with Lucasfilm Games on a new open world Star Wars game as well. So that's, I think, as a game. Oh, that's interesting because yeah. um, Electronic Arts used to have the, the license with Star Wars. Yeah, they did because they've done the, um, 
uh what the battlefront are they are yeah called? yeah yep. they've done those games and stuff didn't they but mm-hmm. yeah so this is ubisoft working on it on an open world title so this could be wow very cool uh yeah like fantasy star online but with star wars a star wars universe yeah well there used to be one like ages ago early 2000s i think there was a, a like a oh uh knights of, of like the a, old republic that's it yeah i yep. think there was an open world yeah game sort of world of warcraft it was the time when war world of warcraft more of, was i think huge. it was more of an rpg wasn't it more of like a kind of yeah but it was like you paid a subscription monthly and it was like an yeah. open world huge sort of thing but this could be you know having this on like next wow. gen console stuff could be really exciting definitely yeah just negative stuff for me, to be honest. Just oh, negative dear. news. James Bond. I should have gone second. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, everybody, let's all go kill ourselves. <laughs> James Bond 007, No Time to Die, has been delayed again, moving from April 2021 to now October. Mm. Um, die another delay is what I'm going to call nice this one. movie. Did you think of that yourself? Thank you very much. I did. I did. That was good. I like it. Um, so yeah. this is sadly moved. Uh, we're possibly never going to see this movie, but I think you know a lot of the big studios have, apart from Warner Brothers, have taken um, an exception to the the back the the backlash to Tenet, the fact that it didn't make you know a substantial profit that it was hoping to mm. when when launching in in movie theaters. So uh, this one's moved back, and I can see it sliding until you know forever when things finally open up, whenever that might be. Yeah. Um, Trailers wise, so uh, this 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 week I watched uh, uh, actually a new uh, Warner Brothers or HBO Max movie, which is one of those being streamed in theaters and also on HBO Max at the same time, like they did with Wonder Woman eighty four, and like they're doing for the rest of their twenty twenty one slate, mm-hmm. including The Matrix four and Dune. This is um, a new thriller starring Denzel Washington, uh, Remy Rami Malek. And Jared Leto involving a murder investigation in present day LA. And this is a really interesting looking movie because it, it's kind of flown under the radar a little bit, I would say, for the last few months. It's kind of come out of nowhere. And when you consider that, you know, you have this this cast. So it's called The Little Things. It looks very kind of seven, like a seven light type thing. Right. But doesn't look like it's doing anything new but when you've got these three you know as in the kind of lead roles and you've got jared leto as as like some kind of creepy kind of murder suspect in it with it looks like he's got some kind of like uh i don't know like some kind of eight ball hemorrhage into his eyes because he's got these like black eyes right um looks really weird that's dropping january 29th so if you've got hbo max uh, you can watch that on January 29th without even having to leave your your house. So the little things that about yourself. Uh, yeah, I picked up on uh, one. I think it came out uh, yesterday. I think on mm-hmm. the day before. And uh, this looks like ridiculous fun. So this is the new um, Mel Gibson uh, film. <laughs> what is it with you and Mel Gibson? I know. I love Mel Gibson <laughs> uh, in films, not in <laughs> not as a human being. A lot of the human being. Um, so this is called Boss Level. I don't know if you've seen this, this trailer. Uh, oh. This is, uh, it looks insane, like absolutely insane. So it's about a retired military operative, which isn't played by Mel Gibson. It's played by Frank Grillo, uh, who you may have seen in Captain America, um, The Grey and The Purge. Yeah. Um, so yeah, he plays a retired military operative and he finds himself in a never ending time loop on the day of his death. Let's do the time walk again. <laughs> so it's basically Groundhog Day yeah. uh, premise, but insanely violent. Like even in the trailer, it probably you see him die in the trailer about 20 times in hilarious <laughs> and extremely violent ways. Frank Grillo. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Mel Gibson plays like the bad guy. Uh, <laughs> that's like sentenced him to this. Like I don't know how it doesn't really explain. He's not it, Santa but... Claus, is he? He's not. <laughs> um, and it's got Naomi Watts in it and Michelle Yeoh as well. Wow, bloody so hell! It, yeah, it's a really weird cast. Um, uh, it's directed by um, Joe Carnahan. Who... Oh no way! Not, yeah, um, so Nark he direct... and yeah, Nark and Smoking A-Team. Aces and the A Team and yeah. he did the Purge as well with Frank Grillo. But yeah, so this looks nuts. It looks absolutely nuts and i really want to see it 
uh, that comes out on the 5th of March. But yeah, you'll laugh at the trailer because you'll just see him get annihilated. <laughs> but it's good because he sort of preempt. He knows when he's going to get killed, and he's he's going through it every day. By the, and it's got really cool, like different characters in it, like comic book like characters. Yeah. and yeah. you just see him preempting stuff, and he's just like you know resigned to the fact he's going to get his head lopped off, or he's going to be run oh. over by this truck, or he's going to be cut in half, or whatever. You know, it's just mental. So that looks very it sounds. Uh, old. There's been a few good kind of time loop movies obviously groundhog day being the one that set the precedent but happy death day which was a blumhouse production i really liked yeah which was about a woman that was gonna get murdered and every day she she got murdered by this serial killer basically and she kept waking yeah. up trying to change it there uh, is quite a few that. of those kind of things i was just thinking about a series i watched last year called russian doll on netflix yep, yep. same thing Palm and Springs. Was, yeah, I was just about to say what was the other one, the Palm Springs one. Yeah, I, I love Palm Springs. I've still actually. not that seen that yet. I need to very close that. to being in my top five, I have to say. Mm. Very close to being in my top five. It was a great comedy. And then Edge of Tomorrow and seeing Tom Cruise get run over by that truck. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, you hear him go, <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, The other trailer I have to mention, because I don't think we would be doing ourselves justice if we didn't, is the Coming to America trailer. Which I assume you must have seen. Yeah, you must have seen it. I have. I had about three people send me a link to it <laughs> when it came out. So I woke up and I was like, three people had sent me the link to the trailer of Coming to America." <laughs> I mean, you know, coming the original Coming to America. It's one of my all-time favorite comedy films. Easily, yeah, it. Eddie Murphy in his prime, just brilliant cast with Arsenio Hall, and they're all back for this as well. Uh, in, yeah so i just i can't wait to watch this this is out on um march the 5th on prime amazon yep. prime video which yep. is interesting so yeah they're all back uh it's about him uh finding out he's got a long lost son who's in the states and he's got a return to america to oh that him. old trope yeah of course i you know i i think i really hope it's going to be fun and not shite but there's a danger it might be but the same director great. as Dolomite is my name, which I love. Yeah, which I loved as well. Yeah. yeah. So I, I've, and Eddie Murphy is coming back to make and Wesley Snipes. Wesley Snipes. Wesley Snipes well, is in, brilliant in Dolomite as well. Yeah, and he's, he's in this as well, isn't he? Yeah. So I'm really looking forward to this. The only Arsenio question got, Hall hasn't aged, has he? Arsenio Hall. It, it seems like exactly he hasn't age. aged at all. Yeah. No. Um, but the only thing, and you know who else hasn't aged? <laughs> the barbershop. The barbershop. The entirety of the barbershop, which must have been in their like what late a 60s, 70s, in the 80s, yeah. are back through movie magic. Yeah. Uh, so, I, yeah, I'm really, really... They should all be that. about 120 each right now, shouldn't they? Easily. Yeah, easily. <laughs> they should be what a dead. schmuck. What a schmuck. Uh, yeah, so looking forward to that. March the 5th. Definitely, definitely. Some good stuff coming. It's going to be a good year, I hope, as long as this stuff doesn't so. get delayed. Um, but yeah, a lot and a lot more trailers to come this year. We'll keep we'll keep you up to date with what those are and where you can see them. So let's jump into the reviews, and we've got quite a few this week. So we're going to fly through these a little bit quicker than we usually do. Um, Phil, we'll get you you started off. So this is Netflix's uh, new new movie, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. Tell us more. Indeed, it is. So this is, um, yeah, the new Netflix drama. Uh, and it's based on a 1982 play of the same name by August Wilson. Um, so it's set in Chicago in 1927. Uh, and it mainly, it's like centered around a recording session for the notoriously difficult to deal with uh, and strong-willed Ma Rainey and her band. Um, so Ma Rainey, for those that don't know, is actually a real person. She was nicknamed the Mother of Blues, and she was one of the first uh, African American professional blues singers, and one of the first to record as well, which is really cool. Um, and from the looks of the film, she was quite a big character as well. <laughs> if she's playing real to life, hmm. um, now I watched it without knowing anything about it. Uh, I think it was just, it came up on Netflix. I was like, that looks cool. I, I did know it was Chadwick, uh, Chadwick Boseman's last film, which I'll go into in a bit, but I didn't know anything about it. Watched it really late at night and I really enjoyed it. So it's, while I was watching it as well, I thought this just feels like I'm watching a play. 
mm-hmm. and I didn't know at the time that um August that Wilson. it was based on a play. Yeah. So it came as no surprise when I saw the credits that said based on the play by August Wilson. Uh because apart from, you know, a few scenes at the start which includes some amazing looking snapshots of 1920 Chicago. It's really well done. There's some really lovely cinematog- cinematography in this. Um, and then a couple of short scenes in the middle. The, the film takes place mostly in two rooms. Um, so that gives it a real sort of theatre feel to it. Um, it just did just feel like watching a play. Um, one of the band, uh, and I guess the sort of standout main character in this film is Levy. And mm-hmm. he's played by Chadwick Boseman um, in, as I said, in what sadly is his final on-screen performance before he died mm-hmm. uh, back in August, which is a real shame. Um, but he does a great job in this. Uh, he plays um, he plays the horn in the band and he's younger than the rest of them. Uh, he's got like bigger aspirations than playing just her music for her. Uh, he writes sort of upbeat versions of her tunes that he tries to get him to rehearse and he writes his own music that he feels is uh, sort of more relatable to the youth of 20s Chicago um, and he thinks he's going to be like the next big style in blues um, and he wants sort of nothing more than to just record his own music and um, rather than just doing sessions for other people which is what he's doing uh, so the story follows the day of recording um, emphasizes the difficulty that the studio faces getting ma to get the recording done because she's constantly playing up or demanding you know things like she has a hissy fit about not having a coca-cola a cold coca-cola ready for her when they're about to record i know the feeling (laughs) just like like asking you to provide me with a cold coca-cola before we start the podcast it's true it's true uh um so yeah, all the while the band are rehearsing in the in the sort of rehearsal room with mm-hmm. split between the two rooms um before they go up to record. Um and they're going through their own sort of dilemma as Levy is becoming increasingly frustrated with Ma having to play the same old music without having his voice heard and you know, he really wants to play his own versions, as I said before. Um the performances in this were stellar, really, really good. Small cast, uh it's only uh, I'm trying to like Rainey, Ma Rainey herself, her band and her two assistants, and then the band manager and the sh- recording studio engineer guy, like the owner. Um, so it's quite, again, it's a theater cast. It's mm-hmm. like, you know, it just relies on really strong performances. So Viola Davis uh, plays Ma Rainey and she's absolutely amazing. So is Chadwick Boseman. There's some, um, but it feels harsh to single them out because the rest of the cast is really equally as good in this as well. Um, it feels like it highlights uh, a lot of difficult issues. Um, there's a few long, emotionally charged, and really well delivered speeches uh, that, and they, you know, sadly highlight the kind of cruel d- oppression that black people face during uh, that particular time mm. in history. Um, but it's really, really well done. Um, so yeah, if, if you want something a bit different to watch or you're missing theater performances, which you might well be, cause I'm sure you won't have been to one of them in the last year. Um, so if you're missing them as much as, as, as movies, then it could be a real winner for you. Cause you know, it's really got that feel about it. So yeah, it's available on uh, Netflix now. Great stuff. Ma Rainey's black bottom then gets a recommendation from the movie mouth TV and movie podcast. Incredible. I know that uh, Denzel's got a, exclusivity agreement now production agreement with um with netflix obviously he produced this um, mm. and also another august yeah, i wilson didn't mention play, that sorry but he did fences, produce it, yeah. yeah yeah he also pro- produced fences which was another august wilson and is bringing um uh more to netflix soon so mm. um he's uh i think he was um very closely aligned allied with um w- with chadwick boseman at the start of his career and actually right. helped him so it's it's actually quite fitting that this was his final film film role um and actually if you're a chadwick boseman fan um it's also been announced that he did record record voices um for uh some um disney plus shows in relation to black panther so okay he will be seen well not seen he will be heard on screen in uh some some marvel related shows coming this year or next year on on disney plus as well that's good great stuff so we've got to check that one out uh for me a slight uh let's let's take a slight left turn 
Uh, I'm going to take you back to the year 1984, a year special to uh, the parents of both Phil and myself, because uh, we were both born we that were. year. What a year. We, uh, we, we plopped out. Um, but not only <laughs> were we born that year, but also Wonder Woman 1984 was set that year. And uh, this is our next review um, with Gal Gadot returning as Diana Prince aka the aforementioned Wonder Woman, uh, where Diana must contend with a work colleague and a businessman whose desire for extreme wealth sends the world down a path of destruction after an ancient artifact that grants wishes goes missing. Mm. And that story um, should pretty much sum up why I really did not like this film. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So Diana does absolutely have to contend with a work colleague and a businessman um and that explains really why this is one of the most boring superhero films that i've had the mispleasure of watching in recent history Indeed. and surprisingly this comes off the back of the the home run slam dunk you could say of what the original wonder woman starring gal gadot also directed here by patty jenkins patty jenkins actually moved into a writing role as well for this she didn't write the original but she did step into a role for this um, it starts off really well um, with a young Diana uh, taking part in a kind of Athenian Olympics style event um, and then brings us up to the year 1984, which, you know, as you would have seen in the tra trailer, brings back Chris Pine's Chris, uh, sorry, Steve Trevor, who, you know, for certain reasons, if you haven't seen it, is uh, kind of impossible to be back. But the whole wish granting element of this ancient artifact um, felt really dumb to me. And, uh, you know, basically people can just wish for whatever they want the most in the world and they'll get it. And it just felt a bit lazy. And mm. to be honest, there were there were a couple of cool-ish set pieces. Um, but for the most part, you know, you've, you've basically got Kristen Wiig as the bad guy in this and Pedro Pascal, a.k.a. Mando from The Mandalorian. Um, so, so you've got some incredible people in there. It just felt like the the villains just felt a bit too I don't know like they it should have just been one of the one villain and focus really on that felt like they were detracting it felt a little bit Spider Man three um you know where there's a little bit too much going on and mm. you know, two villains that have two different agendas and, and that kind of thing um Gal Gadot fine in it you know um the whole initial movie kind of focused on their relationship and their chemistry and weirdly in this one the chemistry wasn't as good it was almost like they were kind of strangers in in this one um which was disappointing um because again i really like chris pine i really like gal gadot uh, you know and i think they were they were really really good in the in, in the first one so i'm very sad to report that warner brothers who you know obviously announced that they'll be launching their major theatrical movies on the hbo max platform um this year that the first major release of it for me was a missed opportunity and you know if you like your comic book movies if you like wonder woman sure check it out but you know even for me i feel like this is one that's worth passing on um and uh and maybe not spending the two and a half hours watching Ooh, zero cool. action um yeah. you know um for for the for the most part so sorry to say wonder woman 1984 gets a miss from the movie mouth podcast Phil Sputnik, Sputnik, <laughs> <laughs> which we haven't been able to stop saying to each other. <laughs> this is the new. Uh, again, it's on. It was released uh, on Netflix on the eighteenth of December, and yeah, Sputnik, and this is a Russian uh, science fiction horror, um, and. I was. I think I saw the trailer for this last year, and I thought this could be up my up, up my alley. And I, I, you know, I don't shy away from a foreign language film. I love foreign language films. It doesn't put me off reading subtitles. And I never. And I say this to everyone: please don't watch a foreign language film with a dubbed audio track, because they're always terrible, and it always takes away from the performance of the <laughs> actors. So just watch it with some subtitles and read them, please, for the sake of everyone. <laughs> It's not that difficult. Unless it's uh, maybe a Studio Ghibli. Because then yeah, that's different. You, you get yeah. a really good uh, yeah. you know, English language cast. Yeah, that's true. But 
most of the time. Do, 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 do. <laughs> Sorry. Let me get back to Sputnik. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, this is so I said it's a it's a science fiction horror. Uh, it's set in 1983, and start. Well, there's a lot of 80s stuff going on. There's a lot of 80s, and it starts with uh, two Russian cosmonauts on their descent back to Earth when a mysterious creature attacks their shuttle. And let's just say, and to quote the poster, the only survivor did not come back alone. <laughs> so it, to be honest, this is a really hard one to talk about uh, without giving much of it away. Okay, let's move action, on. <laughs> regarding the action <laughs> and the plot. So I will simply say that this is really well made and a really enjoyable watch. Um, it puts a bit of a different spin on a genre that can sometimes be a bit repetitive, mm. you know, sort mm. of space, aliens, survival, all that stuff. But this really did keep me interested for the whole of it. Um, really good performances from the cast. It's uh, It's got um, Oksana Akinshina. She plays uh, Tatiana Klimova. And she was in the... Um, she was in the Born Supremacy, I think, but none of the actors I recognise. So, but and the main guy is um, uh, is played by Piotr Fyodorov. Sorry, my Russian pronunciation isn't very good, but he plays Konstantin Vashenyakov. <laughs> Just keep going. I told, with the you, Russian, I told you it wasn't very good with the Russian uh, pronunciation. This is great. Yeah. <laughs> and, Welcome uh, to Duolingo with your host <laughs> Phil. <laughs> Uh, anyway, uh, as I said, great performances, both of them. Um, really, it looks really good. It's It's got surprisingly um, surprisingly decent special effects in it, like really good. Uh, just the right, right amount of gore. It's pretty gory, but it's great. And I think one pleasant surprise about it was that I expected it to be full of jump scares because it just felt like it okay. was going to be that kind of film. Uh, and again, that's way overdone in my book, uh, in a lot of things these days, but it manages doubt. to keep, it manages to keep you on edge without needing to go to them at all. Um, so well worth a watch if you're in the mood for some foreign language, science fiction, horror mm -hmm. Sputnik is available now <laughs> on Netflix. And it gets a recommendation from the it movie does. mouth film and TV podcast. Nice one. That's available on Netflix. I think in Europe, it's also here in the U S on Hulu. So okay. you can check that out. That was a surprise for me when I was scrolling through Hulu and Sputnik popped up. <laughs> um, so I'm definitely going to give that one a go. Uh, for me, we're going back to the land of television and not only to the land of television, but let's go all the way back to the black and white television serials and sitcoms of the 1960s and 70s. No, it's not Bewitched. It's the latest Marvel TV series on Disney+. Plus. I give you WandaVision. This is, without a doubt, the most bizarre TV show that I've had the pleasure of reviewing. Um, but I have to add just a, a slight asterisk. We're only three episodes in so far at the time of review. I've watched all three. Um, and I will reserve final judgment until we get at least halfway through this season. Um, so this is the first season starring uh, Wanda Maximoff. Um, who, of course, was, was played by Elizabeth Olsen, um, also known as Scarlet Witch in the MCU Marvel movies, and Paul Bettany as Vision. Um, here set, I'm guessing, after the events of Avengers Endgame, although I'm not entirely sure, um, because one of them maybe shouldn't be necessarily around. Um, this is basically a 1960s sitcom with laughter track, black and white, uh, square kind of aspect ratio, like a 4-3 aspect ratio, mm -hmm. um, set in a, you know, a kind of domiciled in a kind of uh, white picket fence community with like fake backdrops. And I mean, I can't even really <laughs> explain why, because it's not clear as yet as to why that, <laughs> why that is. <laughs> right. Um, so tough one to review. Um, I'm a big Marvel MCU fan, obviously absolutely love it. I know people who absolutely despise this because they have no idea what's going on. 
Um, I'm again going to reserve judgment. I can talk about it a little bit. It's directed by Matt Shackman, who directed a ton of great TV. Um, you know, most recently, Game of Thrones. It's always sunny in Philadelphia. The Boys, Succession. So it comes from some real kind of um, high profile, I would say, directors and creators. The showrunner is Jack Schaefer, um, and she wrote uh, The Hustle. Um, which was a, a kind of Anne Hathaway, Rebel Wilson starring comedy. And she's also written the new Black Widow movie with Scarlett Johansson. So interesting to see how this is going to tie into some of the other um, kind of MCU based movies. Um, it also has a really nice cast. Uh, it's rounded out by um, a couple of a couple of really great um, actors so far, it includes Catherine Hahn um, from you know a lot of comedies and stuff like that. And she's she's mm -hmm. really, really good in this um and tayona paris who kind of comes into it from around episode two uh so far there are very little super superheroing in this um it's all pretty much uh housewife and you know guy going to work type situational comedy um <laughs> i remember seeing the trailer for this and just being i did not have a clue what was going on no, i mean i've seen three episodes and i still don't have a clue what's going on <laughs> um there are little hints and little things that are getting dropped in there um I'm intrigued. The episodes like 30 minutes long maximum, 25 oh, right, to 30 okay. minutes. So it's it's a short, you know, it's a short thing. There's not only nine episodes in this season. Um it's obviously intrigued to see where it goes. I think it it could expand and go somewhere really interesting and I have a feeling it will. Um I have a feeling that it's uh that it's a bit of a bait and switch with the start, but uh I don't know whether I can recommend this. I'm just going to say the jury's out. Um and if you like your MCU, tune in. Um, maybe stick with it, uh, and we'll see where this one goes. We'll, re we'll report back on this, no doubt, later in the uh, Movie Mouth podcast uh, in the next few weeks. Intriguing. Pretty weird, man. Pretty weird, I'm not going <laughs> to lie. Uh, and then the final review, uh, I'll keep this one uh, super brief, is Cobra Kai Season 3. So Cobra Kai, of course, is the, the show focusing on Johnny Lawrence, the blonde rival to Ralph Macchio's Daniel LaRusso in the original um, uh, Karate Kid movie. Season three here, I won't spoil, um, but it follows on pretty much the same trend. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, Johnny Lawrence and Ralph Macchio, uh, they're both grown up. Uh, they end up fighting again in, in another series. This brings us up to, to speed with the events of season two. This is the first season that was commissioned by Netflix. The other two were commissioned by YouTube on their on their now defunct YouTube Red platform, which is when I watched the the original two. Love season one. Season two, I think season one is one of the best TV seasons of anything I've ever seen. Um, season two, I completely fell off um, with. I think it just went to a place I wasn't really that into. And I think this continues on the trend. It's not as good, not as exciting for me as the, as the first season. It feels a little bit more teen kind of comedy focused, which is fine. Um, but maybe it's just not really for me. So sadly, I can't recommend Cobra Kai season three, even though they do they have commissioned another two seasons at Netflix beyond this. And no doubt, I'll probably watch them anyway. So we'll see where that one goes. Great stuff. Good. So, Philip. Yes. It's only bloody time for this, isn't it? Welcome to Video Store Corner. Philip, please open the door, take a peruse, have a little look around, pick up some videos have a little sniff of that electrical engineered vhs players that you can hear as i rewind the tapes that customers decided not to bring me your membership card and a bag of butter kissed toffee popcorn and tell me what would you like to rent this week this week i would love to rent the 1989 classic that is roadhouse <laughs> So, yeah, yes, please. I'll take Welcome, y'all. <laughs> hey, Pop. Tell us all about it. <laughs> so, for those that have not seen it, this is a, as I said, a 1989 classic starring Patrick Swayze. Yes. As uh, Dalton. Uh, also stars Kelly Lynch as Doc. Sam Elliott as Wade Garrett. Amazing. And Ben Bizarra as 
Brad Wesley, the bad man. Bastard uh, Wesley, they should call him. They should call him Bastard Wesley. Absolute bastard. So, plot-wise, <laughs> I'll read out a little, uh, little bit of text I've got. So, serene and laconic, yet powerful and lethal, Dalton... Swayze. Is I wish, ex- you know, I really hope people describe me like that. What, serene and laconic, yet powerful and lethal? <laughs> <laughs> I think they already do. Um, so Dalton is an expert in martial arts and the best professional bouncer in the business. Oh, he is. Uh, you know, the best professional bouncer in the business. Everybody knows who that is. Of course they do. Uh, with such a reputation, Dalton is summoned in a small town in Missouri to clean up the sleazy bar called the Double Deuce. Double Deuce. Um, uh, to clean it up from the troublemakers who terrorize the customers without knowing, however, that the villainous local entrepreneur, Brad Wesley, wants things to remain unchanged. As Dalton cleans up the nightclub and with it, the town from Wesley's hired goons, a deep wound from a knife will inspire a passionate affair with local doctor Elizabeth Doc Clay. Now, the corrupt Wesley has enough reasons to take Dalton out of the way. <laughs> Nevertheless, the bouncer has the final say. <laughs> Are you sure that was that wasn't a poem? It sounded like a poem. <laughs> it did. It rhymed at the end there. Doc Clay, out of the way. Dalton bouncer has the final say. <laughs> <laughs> do you know what's weird is that that's the description of the movie but it feels so cerebral like it has absolutely nothing to do with the movie that i watched yeah, yesterday right. that's right <laughs> you know what i mean a knife wound turns into a a love affair what well because he goes to the hospital i get it but at it. no point would did i was like oh this knife wound has led to this love affair like it, symbolism bizarre no well uh, i mean there's a lot to say it's a lot to say about this for those that haven't seen it. It's. Can we get it out of the way? Can we just get it out of the way? Go on. Did we have to see Patrick Swayze's butt cheeks so much? <laughs> I saw the bottom of his balls as well, definitely. <laughs> did you? Did you? Yeah. Did you say the bottom of his balls? Yeah, the the under balls. The under ball, yeah. Isn't that a James Bond movie? <laughs> the swinging under balls. Isn't that James Bond under in. Ball. Underball. underball. Like Underball. <laughs> Starring Patrick Swayze. <laughs> we didn't need to see that much of Swayze, to be honest. No. Um, but we saw a lot of... I mean, to be fair, we see a lot of the other sex in this film. There's a, a lot, lot of boobs. Yeah, there's, there's a, lot a lot of boobs. boobs. Hmm. So why not see a bit of balls as well? It's, it's very of its time, isn't it? In terms yeah. of the nudity uh, stakes. Yeah, and the sort of like oh just terror it's so oh yeah it's just it's just mental this film isn't it i think the main observation i've got about this entire film is that to me it feels like you're watching a really long softcore porno <laughs> well yeah I sp- but a really long and higher budget episode of the a team Yes. Do you yeah. know what I mean? It yeah. just feels like the A team, doesn't it? Yeah. It feels like there's a <sighs> people in distress and they call the best in the business to come and sort it all out for them and they sort of then move on to somewhere else. I mean, I don't know why that there's some sort of legendary bouncer circle that everyone seems to know about. Like yeah, isn't it? Yeah, like every bar in the country and they get like headhunted. Like a They're bouncer like, you need Dalton. Head They're like, what's you his surname? <gasps> No one knows what his surname yeah, is. Yeah, then he he's turns up there Dalton. and, you know, he's in a completely different town and everyone goes, oh, that's Dalton. Yeah, everyone it's knows like, him. I know who you, fuck you know you who some bitch. bouncer is from another town. <laughs> it's so really? weird, isn't it? Yeah, it's a really odd <laughs> premise. Uh, I've got to say, though, I really like this film. <laughs> it's so stupid. <laughs> it's so stupid. There's a lot of roundhouse kicks. There's a lot of bar fights. There's a lot of... Uh, Stabbing, stupid, <laughs> lot of stabbings, lot of violence. Question and, for you: How many times yeah. does Patrick Swayze get stabbed in this movie? Loads, absolutely loads. And in the past, judging by the scars on his naked body, he gets uh, stabbed a lot, doesn't he? He gets, yeah. He takes it like a champ, though, doesn't he? Champ, I meant to say, not champ. He does. He takes it. He's a bit of a champ and a champ. <laughs> he is a bit of a champ. 
a chumpy champ. What's your what was your favorite scene in this movie? Uh the best scene is one hundred percent. No, no, don't just say it's the best scene. What was your favorite scene? <laughs> All right. My favorite scene is definitely the scene where um Wade Garrett uh shows up, played by Sam, the brilliant Sam Elliott. The dude and bad. Sam Elliott so Wade Garrett is basically like the he's the best, isn't he? So Dalton Apparently. Patrick's Wade yeah, well, he so was the best. Wade Garrett is the best. Yeah. But and it seems like Dalton learned everything from him. And yeah. He's sort of like the young Wade Garrett. And he's like he's his heir. He's going to yeah. take over the yeah. bouncer throne. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it's got to be said that Wade Garrett is the coolest fucker in the world. Like hundred yeah. percent, he's the coolest guy in the world yeah. ever. Yeah. Um. So he rocks up on his Harley. You know, after getting a, a call from Dalton saying, oh, I think some shit's about to go down. So he rocks up on a Harley. Uh, and he, so it's the scene where he rocks up and uh, out the back while he's turning up, uh, Dalton is getting set upon by all of the bad guys. All bad guys. This felt yeah. like an A-team type scene, didn't it? Yeah, well? definitely. 100%. Yeah. So they are, they're trying to unload boxes of booze, but they're trying to stop, the bad guys are trying to stop it. They're trying to starve the business because... Uh, you know, Dalton's cleaning it up and sort of taking their money from them and stuff. So, uh, they're trying to unload the booze, and basically, he gets in a big old scrap, doesn't he? But he's getting oh, yeah. he's getting beaten up by quite a few guys. Dalton, he's he's giving it his best, <laughs> but he is getting beaten up. And Wade Garrett shows up at the bar, turns up at the bar, puts his sunglasses down. He's like, you know, where's Dalton? And they're like, I think he's out the back. So he just. Uh, wanders out the back slowly to see Dalton being pinned up against a like a, a uh, like a metal uh, no like a wooden uh, post post thing yeah and getting we should say in a non-sexual pummeled. way yeah <laughs> and getting pummeled <laughs> in the in the he's tummy getting, he's pinned up against the post getting pummeled <laughs> uh, so he's get yeah he's getting the shit beat now I mean, basically yeah um, and one of the henchmen comes up to him. Yeah, and so Ed says, says, You want to impossible- fight, Dickless? <laughs> this, is, this is my favorite line for the film, either, as well. So the character's name is Mountain. <laughs> and he says to Wade Garrett, I think they say, like, Who the fuck are you? And then he goes, You want to fight, Dickless? And Wade just goes, Well, I sure ain't going to show you my dick. <laughs> and then just decides to beat the shit out of all of them. He does as well. He properly does. He has them all, doesn't he? Yeah. Uh, brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. I uh, mean, you couldn't you couldn't write a better scene if you tried. I mean, it, to be honest, now you've just explained it, it sounds terrible, but it's the standout <laughs> scene of the movie, <laughs> isn't it? it? Is. I, I think so, yeah. That and also like one of the largest explosions you've ever seen in a movie for really, you don't really, didn't, they didn't really need to go that far. Not really, but no. an absolutely humongous explosion of Red's mechanic shop or whatever it is. Yeah, um, one of the guys that's kind of becomes friends with uh, with, uh, with with Dalton. Um, interestingly, Red was, this old, was the old guy. He's also conveniently the father of the doctor who falls in love with Patrick Swayze. No, he's our right? uncle. He's our uncle. Yeah, and I was reading up on him, and he actually uh, is an actor called Red West. Who his real name. His, his real name was Red. Yeah, I think it was oh. Red Webster in this, but his real name was Red West. Right. And he was actually one of Elvis Presley's closest friends, part really? of his inner circle, and in later years became his personal bodyguard. Wow. Yeah. That's yeah. a fact and a half. And yeah. I've got some more bloody blinding trivia for you in a bit. <laughs> well, let's, <laughs> let, let's get on to that. The one thing I wanted to say is, around your mention of the quote, you want to fight dickless, well, I sure ain't going to show you my dick. Yeah. The word "dick" gets is written is is thrown around so much in this. Every a lot, every, yeah. a lot. Everyone gets called a dick. There's one moment when um, Patrick Swayze, someone says, someone says to Patrick Swayze, "What's the matter, chicken dick?" Um, Red West. Uh, he's talking to Red West, and he says, "Oh, um, you know, are you getting? Are you getting?" Um, you know, is Brad Wesley coming around here and and like extorting money from you? And Red West looks at Swayze and says, does a hobby horse have a wooden dick? Oh, yeah. I forgot about that one. 
<laughs> which is what I'm definitely going to use for the rest of my life. And the answer is no. I've never seen a, a hobby horse with a wooden dick or any dick for that matter. No, but let's be highly inappropriate. <laughs> I guess it kind of is like a long anyway. So the, long yeah, I felt like writing wise, they were just like it was the same person who was just like, you know, what? just say dick. dick in here. Do you know, what? I want to say dick as well. Dick's the best thing. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I tell you what, the, one of my other, I've got a couple of other favorite lines as well. In fact, one of them is going to be mentioned in the trivia, so I'll leave that one out. But the other one is um, uh, towards the end, well, right at the end when um, you know, spoilers, but. <laughs> Patrick Swayze's in Brad Wesley's house. <laughs> yes, he is. He's he's in, take, he gets he's into out, Wesley's mansion, doesn't he? Yeah, and he's taking out his guards one by one yeah. in stealth uh, manner. And then he's in like his massive trophy room, which is full of all like, the hunted animals that mm-hmm. he had. And uh, and Brad Wesley like knows he's hiding in there. And he says, I see you found my trophy room, Dalton. <laughs> the only thing that's missing is your ass. <laughs> I love that one. <laughs> so homoerotic. Actually, just on that point, uh, and talking about best scene. So for me, without a doubt, the best scene in this movie is the chubby henchman during this moment of the movie <laughs> who's in said trophy room, surrounded by all taxidermied animals, heads yeah. and you know stuff. Now, think, you know, Ace Ventura when nature calls and he goes to that room and there's all like, the stuffed animals and he's freaking yeah. out. And he's the henchman's mad, yeah. doing exactly the same thing, isn't he? He's got a gun. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. he's like, I can't, he's like freaking out. You can just tell he's freaking out. And he then he then opens fire on a stuffed polar bear uh out of fright, which we then see is actually being it's not actually alive, but it is being wheeled wielded by Patrick Swayze, <laughs> and he is subsequently squashed by it. He is <laughs> squashed by a polar bear. And he gets up at the end and he's like, I was being squashed by a polar bear. No, he 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 literally he stands up at the end after they've just brutally murdered Brad Brad Wesley in a yeah. in a like a, a circle of shotgun fire, and he turns out he stands up and he look almost looks straight down the camera lens and goes, <laughs> "A polar bear fell on me." <laughs> oh yeah, that was it. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Here's a question for you. Here's a question yeah. for you, Brad Wesley. Mm. So I recognised him. And it wasn't until I looked at IMDb, he was in fact Jackie Treehorn from The Big Lebowski, the the, oh, the porn right. mogul. Remember, he he, he kind of goes to see him and he ends up taking some drugs. And Yeah. And also, obviously, interestingly, is that Sam Elliott is also in the same movie. But on the point of Brad Wesley, a.k.a. Bastard Wesley, a.k.a. <laughs> just for no apparent reason, an absolute bastard to everybody. This guy yeah. is such a bastard that the first time we see him... He is flying his helicopter for no reason all over the all over a farm that's run by an old man who's about to rent a room to Patrick Swayze. And he not only does he fly it over there once, he flies it over twice in a circle and scares all the horses off, isn't he? He's just up for just does he's it, just up he's just, just like for stirring the shit, doesn't he? It's it's honestly it's, he stirs the shit and it's vehicular he's a vehicular liability. Um, the next scene we see Brad Wesley again. We haven't really even been introduced to the character. We've oh, just seen I him know what you're say. flying around in a helicopter. <laughs> the next scene we see him swerving his red drop top convertible all over the place on a country road nonchalantly. Yeah. He's like whistling, while, isn't he? While singing, "Life should be a dream, sweetheart." <laughs> hello, hello again. Oh, oh, hey. And he's just driving from left and right into oncoming traffic and out of the lane. He doesn't even know. And then when when uh, Dalton drives towards him, he doesn't even notice him. He just no. kind of tr- swerves around him. Drives luckily. him off the road. Yeah. <laughs> Rams him off the road and just carries on swerving up the up the road. <laughs> He's a dickhead, isn't he? We then see him. We then see him drive up. Because because he lives across the river from Patrick Swayze, and Patrick yeah. Swayze, I remember he's doing something. But we then see in the next scene, um, Brad Wesley driving a motorized trike along, <laughs> along the river <laughs> bank, and he's just like stops, and then he looks over at Patrick Swayze, and Patrick Swayze looks over, and then he just gets on his trike and drives it off drives again. Off. <laughs> and then and then we see his fucking monster truck, which he has. Again, really for no apparent reason, drive through a car showroom, a Ford car showroom, yeah. and drive over every single brand new vehicle in that car showroom. Yeah. So Brad Brad Wesley, the bastard Wesley, really vehicular mayhem in this. 
was insane. And how many vehicles this guy has, he causes problems in everything he's in. He does. In every yeah. moment of this movie. Every I also, book. What it also what it also made me think is so Brad Wesley, he's like there, he's, you know, kind of, you know, extorting people and like blowing up people's houses. <laughs> really for no apparent reason. No one really knows why. Just because he, he can't control money, them. Really. No. So he just because he, he can't control people, he just blows everything up and basically kills everybody. Um broad daylight there is a a car showroom um everybody's there in the town they're all looking i don't even know why they were there but they're all looking at the these cars for some reason maybe it's some mm. kind of opening some kind of sale on these these ford cars when the monster truck drives through the glass of the building and squashes everything broad daylight again at no point in this movie not a single moment the, and bear in mind all of the chaos that is caused in this movie by brad wesley like mm-hmm explosions fires helicopters monster trucks tri- <laughs> trikes um shotguns blowing cars up in midair yeah not one policeman no this entire I've, film. I've made a note that says exactly the same thing it's like where the fuck are the local police force <laughs> they are nowhere to be seen i mean nowhere. they do mention that he's sort of they're all you know paid off by him but it's just like they're not even making an appearance they're not even doing a show of it are they it's so you see weird. the fire brigade turn up when they blows up reds oh yeah uh, they're car, all right uh you know motor mechanic place but other than that none none of it's, them anyway it's barely alluded to like Apart you said. the end yeah it's exactly it's barely alluded to but it's just such a bizarre film that like there's no cops around and that's Lawless. why i think it feels like an a-team type show yeah, because that's it they never were like around you know in the, in those either because well, you had the military them. trying to chase them down and never catching up with them yeah in the a team yeah so, yep. yeah so do you want some trivia please do uh right i've got a few bits phil's trivia section <laughs> definitely need to do a jingle for this uh so patrick swayze's fame caused problems during filming apparently So a pickup truck containing a group of middle-aged blonde women attempted to drive right up to the star's trailer to meet the actor. Um, During the big fight by the river, a raft of swavely loving ladies sailed by, uh, and a female extra playing a waitress was too busy staring at Swayze to watch where she was going and tripped, (gasps) spilling all of her drinks on another extra. Fuck. I mean, he's such a love boat, isn't he? Yeah. Swayze. Maybe she could see his underball. Maybe she was on that scene there, yeah. Um, due to a knee injury he sustained during filming, Patrick Swayze turned down the roles of Gabriel Cash in Tango and Cash. No. Also oh. 19, 1989. Uh, and also he turned down the role of Mike Harrigan in Predator 2. Wow. 1990. Uh, he chose to make Ghost instead, which is also 1990, uh, as his follow-up, and because it, it was a less physically strenuous role because he had the, the knee injury. So it basically turned out to be a blessing in disguise as Ghost ended up being a mm. huge hit and received mm. critical acclaim, whereas Tango and Cash was a bit of a flop. That's crazy. <laughs> so was I love Tango though. and Cash, though. I love Tango, Tango and Cash. Cash is a great Brilliant. movie. Yeah. Um, so uh, he said at Rose, uh, Roadhouse, Patrick says he once commented that during production, he was not sure he would live through the making of this movie. <laughs> <laughs> Seems a bit dramatic to me, but fair enough. Um, Why? What? Because did he did he actually run away? That there's that scene when they blow up the farmhouse and he mm. saves the the old farm guy, whatever his name mm. is, Eli or something. Eli, whatever, his or something, whatever his name is, yeah. And, Dungaree man, and it looked Dungaree man, and it looked like it was Swayze pulling him out of that house. I think it was the I think wide angle a lot when it blew himself. up. Yeah, yeah, I think it was. Oh, here's one you'll like. So the band. At the very start of this film, when they're in the other club, you know, the first club in wherever yes. it is, like Miami or something, like yeah. Yeah. Uh, 80s club, and it's pumping, and he's the Dalton's, like, the security guy there, yeah. isn't he? So yeah. the, the, the band... Take this outside. Yeah, exactly. So the band that's playing at the start of that film uh, is called Cruzados, right? And uh, after the band disbanded, lead singer Tito... Uh, La Riva formed the band Tito and Tarantula, which is the band that played at the Titty Twister from Dust Till Dawn. Dark, no, no, yeah, that's amazing. That's a nice little link, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So that's the same. Is that guy. Like dark night? Yeah, dark night. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Um, what else? So an off-Broadway production of this film was produced in two thousand and three. 
It had the peculiarly excessively long title of Roadhouse, the stage version of the cinema classic that starred Patrick Swayze, except this one stars Tiamat from the ninth from the eighties cult classic The Last Dragon, nineteen eighty five, wearing a blonde mullet wig. <laughs> <laughs> I would have gone to see that. Me too. Hundred percent. Let's get it back. Uh we should. Let's get a Kickstarter going. Now this one's a bit sad, but interesting. Patrick Swayze and Ben Gazzara, Ben Gazzara yep. played Brad Wesley, died they both died of pancreatic cancer. That is sad. Swayze in two thousand and nine and Gazzara in twenty twelve. Yeah, yeah. It's awful. Um this is a great one. So Marshall Teague, who plays one of the henchmen, Jimmy, he's like the main henchman to yep. uh, to Brad Wesley. He's an asshole, isn't he? Uh, you know, is he the big guy? He's like the, the big, sort tall of guy. Like, no, yeah, he's the, like the, the guy. Well, I was going to say he's the guy with the mullet, but they've all got fucking mullets. <laughs> but yeah, he's <laughs> the guy that where he's like the one that has the main fight with Dalton yeah. on the riverbank. Yeah, business in the, the one, front party. The, at the one back. that basically Dalton rips his throat his out. Throat out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah. physically. Um, so Marshall Teague, Jimmy told a story that he took his mother uh, to the premiere of the movie. So when the fight against Dalton happens and he says the line, I used to fuck guys like you in prison, his mother jumped up and proudly shouted, that's my boy. (laughs) Is that the line? I used to fuck guys like you in prison. I thought it was, I used to fight guys like you in prison. No, he said, fuck guys like you in prison. Jesus Christ. (laughs) That's That's the greatest line in the movie. Uh, yeah it's good that's why i didn't mention it earlier i knew i had that little bit of trivia that's my boy that's incredible can we just talk about that scene for a second yeah he rips his basically swayze rips his fucking throat out and i think that's the one thing that most people remember this movie for yeah i mean they allude to that he'd done that before in uh yeah someone's in the film i heard he ripped someone's throat out yeah with his bare hands yeah wow fucking hell and, and he, he try he's going to do it again to uh, Brad Wesley, isn't he? At the end, he's got like this like weird like oh uh, yeah, you claw really want him thing. to yeah, yeah he's like, like hand I'm claw. going to rip his throat out, and he's like looks over, and the girl, the, the 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 love interest is there, and he's like, no, I can't do it. I better not do it. Yeah, and instead they all blow him away like with pump action shotguns, <laughs> shotguns in a circle. <laughs> so like graphic, a, and he falls so through a 1980s glass coffee table. It reminded me of RoboCop quite a lot. <laughs> he was a lot like that. Um. Speaking of the love interest, Kelly Lynch, who played mm. uh, Doc, his love interest. Now, this is brilliant. So she spent an absolutely pointless month, a month in a real emergency room preparing for her role. What, for she the also, one scene where she, she, also, she does stitches? Yeah. She also learned how to sew a proper stitch for one scene, but it was changed to staples. <laughs> what a fucking pointless <laughs> month of life. She spent a month, like literally, I could have acted the doctor. She just literally goes in there and just like puts some to be, staples to be on honest. His and this is, you know, this is of its time. To me, she just looked like an absolute blonde bombshell in a doctor's lab coat. Dressed in a doctor's <laughs> lab coat. Yeah. yeah, that was yeah. that was the only thing that was in any way like reassuring that she was a doctor. Other than that, she was an air like a an air. Sadly to say, an airhead. Yeah. And that's Roadhouse. And that's Roadhouse. <laughs> um, Can I just say one thing about Ro- about Roadhouse? Not available yeah. in the US on any of the streaming apps. Ooh. I had to I had to pay for it, and Christ. it was three ninety nine to rent in HD on Amazon Prime, Worth where it, it was four ninety nine to buy. So I spent the extra dollar, and now yes! I own Roadhouse because so of glad. you <laughs> forever. <I'm> so glad. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. Brilliant. Um, I think there are some uh, sequels, but nothing to do with anything. And no. They're awful. Never seen them. Don't want to see them. This is no. the best. No. Best. Inverted I mean, he's got a shout out here for the most adequately named um, director of anything ever. His first name is Rowdy. <laughs> <laughs> Rowdy Herring. Rowdy Herrington was the name. Uh, yeah. But, he um, he'd also directed Striking Distance with Bruce Willis. Never seen it. No, I want to see it though because after researching this, I was like, I want well, to see that. Do you know what? I also want to see it. And look, check this out. This I is the description on IMDb. Video store Com- corner coming. Coming from a police family, Tom Hardy ends up fighting his <laughs> uncle after the murder of his father. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Phil. Oh. Tom Hardy was good at that one. <laughs> 
Brilliant. We need to watch that. <laughs> Done. Sold. All right. Well, thanks so much for the uh, the Roadhouse recommendation. That's fine. I'm glad you enjoyed it and you now own it. I own it forever. I'm going to go and watch it now. You watch it again every again. day. Again. Please, no. <laughs> no more. Chicken dick. <laughs> So that was this week's Video Store Corner with Roadhouse. We'll be coming up next week on the next episode with something slightly different. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, Please do feel free to subscribe on all podcast apps and players. And also leave us a nice review if you don't mind. Um, Just a five star would be great on any of those apps. Please, please do. Uh, You can also listen to our backlog of uh, of episodes as well those are again on all of the the players we're currently up to episode 19 but you can go back and check out reviews of some of the movies we talked about in our top 20 uh list uh this 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 episode um and of course we'll be coming to you again in a couple of weeks time so please do keep the listener questions coming in and drop us a follow on our social channels such as instagram uh, at movie mouth podcast or facebook phil mm-hmm. There is just one last thing to say, isn't there? You want to fight, dickless? (laughs) Well, I sure ain't going to show you my dick. (laughs) A polar bear fell on me. (laughs) 